I started realizing, you know, there's a rhyme and reason to this. I started recognizing, first off, that you guys do the same thing every week, basically, um, although with different readings. And I started to ask the questions, well, well why this? Why that? And why these different signs and different motions and movements and responses and everything that we do? And the other thing I started to realize, because I was raised in a Christian home and I had a theology degree in scripture from my undergraduate uh, Protestant school, I started realizing the Mass is full of scripture. I started recognizing the words. I thought, oh, that, that sounds really familiar. I know that from the Bible. It's just a, an illusion. I started realizing, wow, there's a lot of scripture readings in the Mass. And I started paying more attention to the homilists. And then I started asking questions about, well, why communion every week? And what exactly do Catholics believe about the Eucharist? And so I found over time, I went from sort of disillusionment, frustration with the Mass, feeling like a foreigner, I don't know what's going on at all, to someone who fully embraced everything that Catholics do in the Mass and uh, came to love it. And it was only a matter of six months or so at the time I attended my first Mass and then I started embracing everything in the Catholic faith. In fact, you know, I went to my first Mass in June of 2010 in September of 2010, I started RCIA, so that was quite the span of a few months uh, to go that far. And then uh, by October or so, I was pretty sure I knew where this was headed. In April of 2011, I became Catholic, fully embraced everything in the Mass and received my first communion. So I share that from my experience of the Mass, uh, going from frustration and not knowing what's going on to totally embracing and still learning, certainly, still trying to discover and rediscover what's in the Mass, but coming to really appreciate what we have in the faith. And so maybe your story is different from mine, maybe there's some similarities, maybe you come over to Catholicism from a different faith, maybe you've been Catholic all your life, but there's always opportunity for us to rediscover meaning in the literature in our own lives. The meaning is there, it's always been there, but are we going to encounter it? So I'm going to show a little video here. Maybe you can resonate with what I shared, but maybe you'll resonate even more with what uh, Mark Hart is going to share from a video uh, out of the series that we're actually going to be offering coming up uh, starting this Sunday called Alteration, the Mystery of the Mass Revealed. So this is a clip from that series. Let's take uh, Mark Hart and see what he has to say about it. Of our experiences. So, have you ever found yourself bored at mass? Confession <laughs> time. Have you ever found your mind wandering at mass, thinking about all sorts of other things like? playing football game this afternoon, or what I have to do the rest of the day, or you know, my grocery list, or whatever it may be. I think we've all been there, we've all found our minds wandering at mass, and we've maybe even asked the question, what's the point? Why am I here? Is, this, is God's uh, intent just to bore me to death? As he said, I was talking mostly about uh, maybe those kids growing up in the church, uh, but we can struggle with that. I think we all struggle with that. But if we really understand what the Mass is, and are continuously reminded of that, continue to grow in our understanding and then experience of that, I think we'll find the opposite to be true. The Mass won't be boring. It won't be something that we just got to you know, get through this hour and then move on with my day, move on with my week. But it'll really be something that we look forward to and we seek to enter into fully each and every week. So what exactly is the Mass? What does our faith teach us? Well, it teaches us just that. The liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. It's also the font from which all the power flows. So it's the source and summit of the faith. Um, this is also said about the Eucharist itself. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The Catechism from Vatican II. What does that mean? We're going to unpack that throughout the night. But just think about that um, in orientation of your week and what Mark Hart talked about regarding the Sabbath. 
why did God rest on the seventh day? To set aside a day for us to worship, to focus on our relationship with Him. And if the Mass, Sunday Mass in particular, is the source and summit of the Christian life, it's the summit toward which the activity, not only of the Church, but of our lives, goes. So, think of a summit. Everything, you know, the trajectory is towards the summit. And then it's the font or the source from which everything flows. So just think about that in orientation of your week. What would our lives look like if we actually lived that out? If the Mass on Sunday was the summit to which our whole week pointed, and it was oriented towards, and the font from which everything in our week flows. Everything in our life, everything in our Christian life revolves around this worship, this experience that we have at the Mass. That's why it's so central and important for all of us. Mass is also the highest form of prayer. So there's many different ways that we can have a prayer life and a healthy, good prayer life um, day to day. The Mass is always going to be the highest form of prayer. It's communal prayer. All prayer is communal. There's no strictly private prayer because we're always praying with the church. Um, but the Mass, we're literally doing that. We're praying with our parish community together. And it's the highest form of prayer because we're doing that in community and we're also offering the sacrifice of the Eucharist, which we'll talk more about later. So, as the Catechism says, in the liturgy, all Christian prayer finds its source and goal. Similar language there, as far as our prayer lives, our Christian lives, the source and goal is all found in the liturgy, the Mass. Then it gets even better. The Mass, our faith teaches us, is heaven on earth. So this is something that I encourage you to keep in mind when maybe your mind's wandering at Mass or you feel like, I'm a little bit bored here or I just got to get through this and then I can move on. We believe that the Mass is heaven on earth and, and uh, what we mean by that is John Paul II says the liturgy we celebrate on earth is a mysterious participation in the heavenly liturgy. So there's this coming together in the Mass of the liturgy in heaven, we read about that in scripture, that there's this liturgy going on, like the angels we hear in scripture saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, nonstop in heaven. We sing that in Mass. Um, the, the revelations uh, the, to John in the book of Revelation, we hear about the wedding feast of the Lamb, that he's in heaven, he's seeing this liturgy going on, we see white robes, we see incense, we see candles, we see... Jesus, the Lamb, he was slain there at the center. All that we do in the Mass here is to be an imitation and a participation in the heavenly liturgy. And this finds evidence further in Scripture because that's what was the case in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when God directed the Israelites under Moses to build the tabernacle and then later for Solomon to build the temple, what did he say? This is to be modeled after heaven. You know, he gave such specific instructions for cubits, the lengths, the amounts, the size, everything, all the sacred vessels that were to be used. And it was to be an image of heaven, the heavenly tabernacle. And so in the New Testament, when we have the church, when we have the mass, that's exactly what our liturgy is supposed to be, an image replication, so to speak, on earth of the liturgy and the worship going on in heaven. So there's this sort of uh, kissing, for lack of better words, of heaven and earth that happens in the Mass. So often we get caught up in the here and now, and this is my life, and I don't think about heaven that wants to come. The Mass is an encounter with the heavenly liturgy. So we have John Paul II saying that. We also have Vatican II. <coughs> In the earthly liturgy, we share in a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy toward which we journey as pilgrims. And we talk about the Mass, the Eucharist in particular, as being bread for the journey, on the journey to heaven. So we're pilgrims along the way, and the Mass is that participation to prepare us for the heavenly liturgy. And uh, we need that because what if we die and we get there and we don't have a clue of what's going on because we didn't spend our life practicing for the heavenly liturgy to participate in. Mass is that journey along the way which those important steps on our journey to heaven. 
And the Mass itself, we've already talked a little bit about, has rules in the Bible. We're not going to go through this in great detail, but I just wanted to put this up there. Just from the New Testament itself, look at how many passages there are that are foundation, sorry, sorry, foundation for the Mass. Of course, the Last Supper is the institution of the Eucharist and the institution of the Mass by Jesus. Bread of Life Discourse would be a corresponding passage in John where Jesus says, um, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will live forever. We'll unpack that a little further later. The Road to Emmaus. I don't know if you've ever looked at the story this way, but in Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection, Jesus, uh, two disciples are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and Jesus comes along and walks with them and they don't recognize him. He explains the scriptures to them and how they are fulfilled in himself. And then they get to the place where they're stopping their journey and they invite Jesus in. They break bread and recognize him in the breaking of the bread. It's a sign that this is where you'll see me from now on in the breaking of the bread of the Eucharist. And there's that two parts. Jesus explained the scriptures, the liturgy of the word, and the breaking of bread in that story, very much modeled for the Mass. After the Apostles, we have the early church breaking bread together. They are worshiping together in ways that correspond very closely to what we know as the Mass. Paul talks about the Eucharist. He talks about our Paschal <coughs> Lamb has been slain. So let us celebrate the feast. Let us keep the feast. Let us keep the new Passover, basically. Is the Mass the Eucharist. And then, as I mentioned before, Revelation is basically an image, a vision by the Apostle John of the heavenly liturgy. And so, uh, I know Revelation gets a lot of attention for being about end times and apocalyptic things, and there's some of that in there, but the Catholic understanding of Revelation is it's about the Mass. It's an image of the heavenly liturgy, and it tells us a lot about our own liturgy. So that's just a little overview of biblical roots of the Mass. There's a lot more we would say if we went to the Old Testament, it's just the New Testament. But I want to show how what we do today not only has its foundation in scriptures, principally, and um, through those examples, but literally in history back to the earliest days of Christianity. That what we do today, every Sunday, we may think is maybe mundane and, and so common to us, has been done for 2,000 years in the church. And we'll talk a little bit later, too, about how important this was, how central it was to the faith of Christians throughout the centuries, even to the point of death. They would give up their life to be able to go to Mass. So we have um, something called the Didache, first century Christian text. This is the earliest Christian text that we have outside of the New Testament. So written about the same time as the New Testament. Um, the Didache, first century Christian text says, On the Lord's own day, Sunday, gather together and break bread and give thanks. Give thanks, by the way, is where we get the word Eucharist in Greek. That's what it means. Eucharist means to give thanks. Having first confessed your sins so that your sacrifice may be pure. That's, maybe sounds familiar. For in sin, we should go to confession. We should experience the sacrament of reconciliation before partaking of the Eucharist. For this is the sacrifice concerning which the Lord said, In every place and time, offer me a pure sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is marvelous among the nations. This is from the Old Testament. It's a prophecy. It talks about sacrifice, and it says, In every place and time, offer me a pure sacrifice. And what's this first century document saying? <clears throat> that pure sacrifice is the Eucharist. That's what we do on Sundays. And it's directing Christians, it's so written Christians, that on the Lord's Day on Sunday, gather together and break bread. Celebrate the Eucharist. Give thanks. In light of this. <clears throat> Even more evidence, um, in, in the second century, so just over 100 years after the time of Christ, St. Justin Martyr wrote an apology, not because he was sorry, but because he was defending the faith. An apology in defense of apologetics. So he was defending the faith against um, the pagan 
Romans who were questioning and accusing Christians of doing certain things. And remember, Christianity in this day was illegal, and so it was very much under the radar as far as their worship. They would sometimes gather in the middle of the night, gather in homes predominantly. So they weren't very public. You don't think of big cathedrals, big basilicas, big churches that have a public scene, but house churches where they're meeting more covertly and, um, and, and they're being persecuted. And so he is writing a defense for the Christians explaining what we do. Because there are a lot of questions because they would be in the middle of the night and there are a lot of accusations and misperceptions, stereotypes, and oh, that's what Christians are doing. He is explaining very clearly, you know, this is what we do. He said, on the day we call the day of the sun, so I put parentheses in here to explain and correlate with what we know in the Mass. Sunday, all gathered in the same place. The memoirs of the apostles, which would be the New Testament, are, and the writings of the prophets, which would be the Old Testament, are read. Sound familiar? Okay, we do that. As much as time permits, maybe we don't do that part. <laughs> they just be there all day. As much as time permits, they just read and read. When the reader has finished, he who, who, he who presides, the presider of the liturgy, the priest or the bishop, over those gathered, admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful <coughs> things that we just heard read. That's the homily. Then we all rise together and offer prayers. What do we do after the homily? Prayers of the faithful. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss. Now, we don't exactly do that. Maybe a lot of your husband and wife. Um, but this is a sign of peace. And in biblical times in the early church, it was a kiss. Think of like Hispanic culture, Middle Eastern culture, you know, kiss on the other cheek. It's like our handshake. So, we replace a handshake. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the bread. Presentation of the gifts. The bread and the wine are brought forward by members of the congregation to the presider. He takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe. Through, this, through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and for a considerable time he gives thanks that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. Liturgy of the Eucharist, the Eucharistic prayer. That's exactly what Father does today. It takes a considerable amount of time to offer prayers and thanks and offer these gifts up to the Father. When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgivings, all present give voice to an acclamation by saying, Amen. This is the great Amen that we do in Mass. We usually sing it in Mass on Sundays. When he who presides has given thanks, and remember, Giving thanks, um, offers praise and glory for me, gives thanks, Eucharist and Greek. It's just a great one. When he who presides has given thanks and the people responded, those whom we call deacons, <laughs> give to those present the Eucharistic bread, wine, and water, and take them to those who are absent. Communion. So, after all of it, the prayers, and then we would receive, and then, it's a little different today, but back in the early church, they would immediately take the consecrated uh, elements, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, out to the home now, the sick. We have them in the tabernacle, and people throughout the week, also on Sunday, and take them to the home now, and sick. And that's primarily the role of the deacons. Does this all sound a little bit familiar? So remember, this is Christians in 155 AD doing exactly what we do today. So think about that when you're in Mass, that Christians have been doing this liturgy, basically the same liturgy. We even have early church versions of the Eucharistic prayer. And they're almost the same words that we use today. We have a few different options today, so it's expanding. But, but they're very similar words to used today. So our, our, our faith is very rooted, and what we do in the Mass is very rooted. It's not, and, and I think that goes to show that it's not just um, man-made. Well, the if biblical evidence in the early church evidence shows that this comes from Christ himself. It 
comes from God revealing this, and this is how God wants us to worship. So it's not some man-made invention that people in the Middle Ages just got together and said, well, let's just make Catholics really bored, and uh, <laughs> we're just going to do it this way, and script it all, and make all things. Yeah, and still it's this day, I mean, it's, it, the Mass is the Mass, and it shouldn't be. Words are supposed to be changed, or edited, made up on the way. And, and this is why, because it's so rooted in Scripture and history. It goes back, this is how God has instructed us through Christ to worship Him. Okay, so let's talk about the Eucharist itself then, a little bit. <clears throat> we already said the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. The other sacraments, indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the Apostolate are bound up with the Eucharist and oriented towards it. So again, that source and summit sort of language. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ Himself, our past, our, our pastoral plan, the description there. So again, the Eucharist itself, the source and summit. Where do we get the Eucharist? In the Mass. Without the Mass, there's no Eucharist. And, you know, those who receive outside of the Mass, where do we get the consecrated hosts? They're consecrated with of the Mass. Okay, so in brief, then, the Eucharist is the sum and summary of our faith. Our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn, in turn confirms our way of thinking. Have you ever thought about that in your own life? That is the Eucharist who should determine your way of thinking? It in turn confirms our way of thinking, the sum and summary of our faith. That we should have a Eucharistic mindset Eucharistic look at the world, seeing things ultimately through the person of Christ and his presence in the Eucharist. <clears throat> We're going to talk about three aspects of the Eucharist in the context of the Mass. All these apply to the Mass just as much. Um, the Eucharist, we say, is a sacrifice. And this is language that maybe some people aren't real comfortable with or aren't real familiar with. Maybe decades ago it was used a little bit more commonly. It's just as much debate today as it was back then. Um, the Eucharist is a sacrifice. And we hear that language in the Mass. Uh, the Father says that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable and pleasing. So the Catechism says the Eucharist is thus a sacrifice because it represents or makes present the sacrifice of the cross, because it is its memorial and the because it applies its fruit. So, just a little background again on the sacraments uh, in general. Remember, the sacraments are invisible signs of visible grace. The sacraments are the means by which Christ communicates his love, his mercy, his grace to us here and now. <coughs> and they're the connection between the event in history in space and time 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, which is the means by which all grace forgiveness has been won for us and offered to us. And then we have to ask the question, how does that event in Israel 2,000 years ago connect to me in 2016 in Iowa? How does it get to me? How, how, what's the connection? And we believe as Catholics that the sacraments are the connecting point. That Christ instituted sacraments which are tangible signs, they're, they're physical, material things, that impart invisible grace to us and give us that divine life that Christ offers to us on the cross. So all the sacraments do that. But the Eucharist in particular, in a special way, because it represents or makes present the sacrifice of the cross. So remember earlier I said the Mass is like heaven on earth, and heaven, we could say it both ways, either heaven comes down to us or we kind of come up to heaven in the Mass. Um, similarly, in the Mass, we are made present at the foot of the cross, or vice versa, the cross is made present to us. That event that took place in space and time 2,000 years ago is made present to us in the universe. It's represented to us today. And so everything that's associated with that, everything that comes with, the, with that sacrifice is there so we say body, blood, soul, and divinity, which 
Jesus Christ. That's all of Jesus. His divinity, his humanity, everything is right there. And we are made present at the cross and therefore participate in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus in resurrected form is also present uh, to us. It's conquering sin and death is present. It applies the fruits, therefore, of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to our lives. And the Catechism also says that the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. They're one and the same sacrifice. So sometimes we as Catholics get accused by non-Catholics of re-sacrificing Christ. So every time you celebrate the Mass, you're, you, it's called the Mass is sacrifice, and you must be re-sacrificing, or you must believe that Christ's sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago was not sufficient enough. You have to add something to add the sacrifice of the Eucharist. That's not at all what we believe. We're not adding anything. And we're not doing a separate sacrifice. We're participating in the once for all sacrifice. So the Catechism says that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the sacrifice of the Eucharist that we celebrate at Mass are one single sacrifice. They're one and the same sacrifice. It's just a participation in that. Okay, so the Eucharist and the Mass are a sacrifice. We talked a little bit about the Eucharist as the real presence of Christ. And this is very distinct for us as Catholics. Um, this is something I wrestled a lot with in my journey towards the Catholic Church. But we believe that Jesus becomes present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. That the Eucharist, once it's consecrated, is no longer bread and wine, but the body and blood. Christ. And there's a true substantial change that takes place when the consecration occurs in the context of Mass. And that, therefore, that's, I mean, that's why we do everything we do about the Eucharist. That's why we are called to prepare ourselves. We're called to confess our sins, to be washed clean, to be in a good state of grace when we receive. That's why we're called to receive reverently. That's why we genuflect, because when we genuflect, Bending the knee to the king, the king of kings, Jesus, present in the tabernacle, and for present on the altar. That's why we kneel during the liturgy of the Eucharist. All of these things only make sense if we hold to this belief. That's why, like we're going to do in a few weeks, uh, for over 24 hours at St. Joe's, that's why we have Eucharistic adoration. When I was Protestant looking at the Catholic Church, uh, it became very black and white for me on this issue because. I realize that if Catholics are wrong about this, then they, we literally worship bread. Think about Eucharistic adoration. What are we doing? We're kneeling before the host in the monstrance, and we're orienting our adoration, our worship, toward the Eucharist. Eucharistic adoration. And everything we do in the Mass, too. So I realized that if they're wrong, if the Catholic Church is wrong about this, Catholics are bread worshippers. And there's a lot of people out there who think we are bread worshippers. Um, there's little evangel evangelical tracts that go around that say we're bread worshippers. Um, and it became so black and white that I realized if the Catholic Church is wrong about this, then I should never join. I should try to take everyone I can out of the church. But if they're right about this, then that's Jesus. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And I want that. I want, that's, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than with Jesus. Because I have a relationship with Christ, but you can't get more intimate in a relationship with Christ than receiving Him in communion. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. That's how close He comes to us. He lets us consume His very self uh, in the universe. And as we say, Contrary to how other food works, when you consume it, it becomes part of us. Us consuming the Eucharist makes us a part of Him. And we become more like Christ and more part of His body, more fully a part of His body, by receiving the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is real presence. Um, <coughs> catechism, just highlight the, the last part there, the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. Real presence, truly, really, substantially present to us in the Eucharist. And then finally, the third 
part is the Eucharist, the Mass, Holy Communion. What do we mean when we say communion? We, we throw that term around, we refer to receiving communion, and um, that, you know, I think most Catholics understand that to be sort of the climactic point, the pinnacle point of the Mass. Some Catholics think it's the end of Mass. Um, but, <laughs> but you know what they say, who was the first person to leave Mass early? Judas. Don't be Judas. <laughs> so, communion. Why is it so important? Why, why, why do we call it communion in the first place? With, left, with union. And there's a vertical relationship going on here and a horizontal relationship going on. The vertical is communion, union with God. We're united with God through the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, through receiving Him, and we're united with one another. It's not a private act. We don't typically receive communion or go to Mass privately. It's a communal thing. We do it together. And that's very important to understand. It's a, it's a meal. Holy Communion is a, is a communal meal. And we see that all over Scripture, communal meals in the Old Testament and the New Testament are central to the faith. So those are all true of the Eucharist and the Mass uh, itself. Why is this all important at the end of the day? Why does this all matter? And how does this maybe reorient in our look at the Mass? I think if we understand that when we go to Mass, uh, it's not just empty ritual, it's not just things that we have to do, always done, so therefore we're going to do it. It's like you know, family traditions, you know, it's just always been this way, always done it this way. You know, don't ask why, just do it. Well, the why behind it is ultimately the presence of Christ in an encounter with Jesus and also with each other. And like I said before, it, it is as close as we can really get here on this earth to experiencing what Jesus did for us on the cross and his resurrection. It is face to face with Jesus. It is an encounter, a deeply personal encounter with the risen Lord in a way that transforms us. And like with all the sacraments, God gives us grace through the sacraments to transform us. But at the same time, God's a gentleman, I like to say. Uh, God's a gentleman because he doesn't twist our arms and force us to do something. He doesn't ever force us to change. He invites us. And so, you know, we talk about maybe the obligation to go to Mass. Mark Hart references in the video, it's a sin to not go to Mass. It's breaking one of the commandments and not the uh, I knew a priest up in the Twin Cities who said, when we talk about a holy day of obligation, he likes to refer to it as a holy day of opportunity instead. It's an opportunity to go to Mass and to encounter Christ to be transformed. But the fact of the matter is, we can go to Mass all of our lives, every week, maybe even every day, and still not be changed. This was something I wrestled with, too, on my journey with the Catholic faith. And talked to some of my Protestant friends about, about this, and they were saying, well, how could what the Eucharist, what the Catholic Church says the Eucharist is be true? Look at how all those Catholics live their lives. You know, look at so many Catholics who don't look any different from the rest of the world. And I wrestled with that, and then I realized that God's a gentleman. He doesn't force our arm or make us change. And I also realized that the Catholic understanding of the sacraments is that they're not magical. It's not like you're baptized and zap, you're holy, you're perfect, and you're never going to make a mistake again. Or you go to communion, and all of a sudden you want to pray a rosary every day just because you receive communion. Um, there may be some of that going on desire grows in you, but with all the sacraments, we, we have something called our disposition to receive, and that is what determines the fruit that will take place as a result of receiving that sacrament. So we can go, someone can go to Mass every week or every day for all of their lives, and go to Mass hardened, not open to being transformed, walk into Mass, oh, I've got to be here, just get through this, and I'm going to live my life however I want, and move on to things. And they, even though they're 
a more regular mass attender than most, their life might not look any different as a result. Same reason why so many people are baptized as an infant and grow up to leave the church and have nothing to do with Christ. Like what happened? Did they not catch with this person? You know, not work? Uh, well, the grace is there, the grace is given. And that's just what I want to stress is what we're talking about here with the Eucharist and the Mass is objectively true and always true. But then there's our part. Are we open? So it's a change of mentality, a change of attitude. Am I going to Mass thinking, okay, I just got to get through this hour so I can move on with my day? Or thinking, I just have to go to Mass. That's just what I do. I'm a Catholic. Parents taught me to go to Mass every week, never miss Mass. So I was in trouble. God's not going to love me as much if I don't go to Mass. Or is my attitude, what can I give? How can I be transformed by Christ? Not so much what can I get. So many people leave the church say that. I wasn't being fed. I went to church every week and I wasn't being fed. I wasn't getting anything out of it. Uh, I think if you talk to most of those people, and I know plenty of them myself, you find that, that the, the true story is I went to Mass and I wasn't entertained. I didn't get what I wanted. It wasn't fun. You know, didn't really compare it to that football game I watched in the afternoon. It was exciting and exhilarating and you know, got me revved up. Um, it was boring. But if it's an attitude switch, what, not what can I get out of Mass, but what can I give, and how can I participate more fully, and how can I encounter Christ more deeply here, how can I find Christ to seek Him out there, and then how can I be changed? Not just what can I get out of it, but how can God transform my heart and my life through this? And then I think we'll start to see great fruit. We open up ourselves, really give our attention, fully and actively participate in the Mass, and just let God do the rest. We'll see. And God will really work through the Mass and through the gift of the Eucharist in particular in our lives. So I invite you to do that, to attentively invest and proactively seek to give and participate in the liturgy each and every week. And prepare yourself. You know, it's so hard on Sundays when there's so much chaos, especially when you have little children. Um, does anyone ever have experience that Sunday morning is usually the worst morning of the week? Where as families go, like kids are unruly and no one can get along and everyone's at each other's throats and the greater hands. The only one who needs confession of the poor mass. But try to prepare throughout the whole week, source the summit, orient your week towards the mass, and let everything flow from it. And I want to just end before our short break um, with a video <coughs> that really hits home on this point. Because we can get stuck in noise and emotions and routine, and it's comfortable and it's easy. But think about the early church. Think about Christians throughout the centuries, what they experienced. And think about even today, what Christians are experiencing around the world. Because not everyone can just show up to Mass comfortably, easily, without consequences, without persecution. There are many Christians around the world, many Catholics, who have to do so secretly, who have to um, risk their lives, risk maybe their family's lives, risk, the, risk imprisonment, risk severe persecution to go to Mass. And there's story after story throughout the centuries of people who gave their lives for Christ in the Eucharist who said, I'd rather die, I'd rather give up my life, than this Mass. So, let's let Crystal Fanning help us.